Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everybody back from our uh, to our event. It's been a great uh, couple of uh, hours. Yesterday, we spent uh, exploring the intersection with uh, education with Marcella Designor. We then got head on with uh, a lot of other information relating to self-sustainable communities from Ora Mendelssohn. Got a chance to ask uh, our panelists, uh, including Regina Gray from the HUD, uh, about the future of urban development and what it means for us and how will we come to work together to kind of improve the quality of life for a lot of people. Uh, and uh, we also had a chance to hear from Yang Bodu, who will be presenting today his blueprint on uh, the post-COVID uh, reconstruction. And we're definitely excited to have a lot of our people today. Once again, we are broadcasting across different channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and um, YouTube as well. So please feel free to reach out to us and share those links everywhere uh, that you see them on your favorite social network. Our first speaker today is Marcus uh, Diamond from VIA, the ride sharing company. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Marcos Diamond. I'm on the East Coast Partnerships team for VIA. And I'm really excited to connect with you all today, uh, virtually. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is how transit tech has given us a really excellent opportunity to rethink public transit and urban design. And I'll talk a little bit about the work VIA has been doing to help build the public transit system for the future. So to st set the stage a bit, I want to provide some context on the historical transit landscape. So from around the 1930s to early 2000s, the predominant view that guided transportation planning and urban design was largely centered around ownership and you know, utilization of personal vehicles. And cities were really built around this core idea. But now we're at a crossroads where technology is rapidly accelerating the shift in the transportation industry. And because of modern algorithms and the sharing economy broadly, we're really able to rethink the role that transportation plays in our communities with the core goals of getting people out of their cars, uh, reducing congestion, reducing emissions, and making public transit more convenient and accessible. And because of this shift, there's really a chance to reevaluate the large opportunity costs of making poor decisions within urban design. And currently the average parking structure that's being built, for example, is built to last 50 years, which really doesn't make sense when you think about the advancement of autonomous vehicle technology which is widely projected to be fully rolled out in the market in the next 25 years, which is a conservative figure. So as a result, a lot of really progressive municipalities across the country, like Buffalo, Hartford, Santa Monica, are actively reducing their parking requirement minimums because they know that the reliance on the personal vehicle is gonna go down over time. And another important consideration is the sheer dollar figure associated with such capital intensive projects. And these are typically funds that could have been invested back into the community in the form of parks, after school programs, education, etc. And the last point I'll touch on this is that the cost of owning a car in Hudson County is around $9,000 a year. And Really, when we build cities around personal vehicle ownership, we disclude from that thinking large portions of the community that actually can't afford a personal car and aren't even getting the benefit of other transit-oriented initiatives, 
which altogether makes cost a fundamental barrier to mobility. And up until now, there really wasn't a great way of solving these mobility challenges. So traditional transit systems, they tell you to put a large vehicle on a straight route or implement a light rail and stop at points that correspond with high density areas where people largely live and work, which is why property prices are more expensive near fixed routes and light rail. But you know, because of this system and because technology didn't exist when these systems were put in place, it left a lot of people out of the network. And if you don't live in a dense corridor where these fixed routes run, you're really largely left out. Um, and you can imagine, given this example here with the fixed route in red, if you live on the eastern zone of this map, for example, you really have a hard time accessing these physical bus stops. So VIA's philosophy is that anyone should be able to access transit in any space. So we do that through a series of virtual bus stops. And by allowing people to book a ride through a smartphone app at their origin point, VIA's algorithm can search through a space and match riders with the closest virtual bus stop and really improve the convenience and accessibility of the overall transit system. And through doing so, we've seen that you tend to attract more riders while also reducing the per passenger cost associated with running lightly utilized or even empty buses down uh, pre predetermined routes. And as ridership increases, the cost per passenger per ride decreases. And that means you can invest more on a per capita basis. So what I just described was largely where transit was and where it's heading. So I'm gonna shift gears a bit and start to highlight how VIA implements these virtual bus stops and improves the lives of people within the community, as well as help real estate developers in the community rethink urban design and shift away from a mindset of reliance on you know, developing in proximity to existing routes. And just to highlight some of the work we've done so far, basically we've been able to take this core principle of increased accessibility to and convenience of transit and apply it to municipalities across the world. So we currently have over 150 partnerships in over 20 countries. And at the core of our software, there are three main components. First is the ability to pair riders traveling along a similar path at the same time. Second, the software and algorithm matches riders with the best, most efficient vehicle to serve that ride. And then finally, it's dynamically directing both the driver and the passengers to the nearest pickup spot or virtual bus stop. And to give you an example, you know, something that we've done real world, um, this is a deployment in Jersey City that we launched in February of this year, right before COVID, and it's still active and running today. And the fleet consists of these Barney purple Mercedes vans that fit six passengers. Um, but currently right now, due to COVID, there is a reduction on capacity to three passengers at a time. And anyone in the city can access the service either by downloading the app or calling into a dispatch line for those do, who don't have access to smartphones. And the service was designed intently with different rules, if you will, depending on where you are. So the first being, if you're in this blue outer zone, you could go anywhere within the system. Um, but you know, if you're in the central zone, highlighted in purple, and request a ride, you have to go to the outer zone. And the reason we did this was because the central zone was so transit rich already that they didn't want the service to cannibalize the existing transit network's ridership. And one last rule that I'll note here is that if you're taking a ride in the outer zone, you incur a 50 cent per mile charge. 
And this was implemented to disincentivize really long trips that tied up vehicle supply. Um, and we wanted to encourage folks to be more thoughtful of the existing transit services uh, that you know, may be in close proximity that would be able to serve the same route to them. And the real benefit of you know, modern algorithms, especially what we have at VIA, is that you can write these sorts of rules into the design of this transit system to account for these different dynamics and be able to influence you know, the broader community behavior and really have a say in the future of you know, the city's urban development decisions. And some other things I want to highlight here is that, <clears throat> excuse me, since February, um, during the peak morning commute hours of six to nine, the top three destinations for passengers has just naturally been PATH and light rail stations. And I want to emphasize this because a lot of times these systems are facilitating first last mile trips, connecting riders to existing transit networks. So if you're a developer, you can build a, build, a build a building that's three miles away from the existing light rail station and charge comparable rent as long as folks have a mode of connection to and from your building and the existing network. So this is all to say that when rethinking urban design, we don't have to think about really expensive projects like building a new station or light, light rail line. And instead, we can think about where to put our communities and how to connect them with what already exists by utilizing micro transit networks as an intermediary between the two. And one last thing I wanted to highlight about the Jersey City service really gets to the core of the transit equity and accessibility point. We found that low income riders who largely don't have the luxury of deciding to take their own cars were the folks who relied on the service most heavily during COVID. And they saw the system as a tool to really help them get back to work during a time where the existing system was running on a reduced schedule and wasn't as reliable. But you know, these micro transit systems and what V is doing are not only you know, systems that attract exclusively transit dependent riders, it's also a really powerful tool for getting folks out of their cars altogether. So Cupertino is a city with massive congestion problems. As some of you know, it's where Apple has its headquarters and it's a largely well-off community. But we partnered with them to provide a service with the hopes of alleviating that congestion problem. And when we surveyed riders, we found that about 70% switched from single op occupancy vehicles. So not only has microtransit you know, been a way in the case of Jersey City to provide accessible and reliable transit to those without their own vehicles, but it's also proven to be successful in generating ridership where people are ditching their Teslas and Mercedes so they can get around quicker and not have to double or triple their travel time sitting in traffic. And to really paint a broader picture here, like I said earlier, we have over 150 active services, all of them taking different shapes and implementing unique parameters for their use cases. Arlington in Texas, for example, completely replaced their public transit system and now fully runs on on-demand microtransit, whereas Newton in Massachusetts is a service that is only available to seniors, where over 70% of the rides are actually booked over the, over the phone versus through an app. So all this is to say that there are many different ways to design a service with the incentives for community behavior in mind, and it's up to you guys to decide the goals and priorities for the Bayonne community. And we can help you build a service that really helps facilitate those goals. Um, and with that said, I really wanna thank you for your time today and feel free to reach out at any time um, with any questions. If you'd like to chat more, my email is on the slide um, in front of you. And it's really been a pleasure today. Thank you so much.
Thanks a lot, uh, Marcus. Uh, once again, from VIA, thank you so much. If you have any questions for Marcus, please hit us up on any of the socials. We are waiting live to hear from you. Um, our next speaker will be, let's check the agenda, actually. <laughs> Yang Bodu. That is going to be great. Uh, he will be speaking in around eight minutes. Yang Bodu is already ready to start. <laughs> but we definitely want to wait for the audience to come on through. All right? Definitely. Well, next up, Yang Bodu. Why don't you take it away? Great. So, um, again, uh, have my up. Okay. Okay, yep, uh, now that worked. Apologies for that. Um, so just to uh, preface a bit, uh, it's uh, very at poll that you uh, had um, Marcus uh, Diamond uh, go prior since he did touch upon a few good points about the concept of uh, microtransit, uh, which is actually a good uh, segue into who I'm going to dive a, deep, uh, a bit deeper in um, during this talk. And uh, for those of you tuning in, you have seen some of the links I had posted uh, through the chat uh, about um, from a transit planner, uh, Jared Walker. And he had a series about uh, what the concept of uh, microtransit can and cannot reasonably do. And then first, uh, just in short, a concept to keep in mind, which basically means that you shouldn't uh, be discounting the approach, the potential of transit oriented development or ensuring location efficiency, ensuring that more development, more people actually live within the close proximity of fixed routes is this concept between uh, ridership and coverage or the latter, as some like to say, availability. And microtransit, to be clear, is very much in the uh, latter, given that if you take uh, shared vehicles, and if you look, even look at the numbers from uh, APTA, American Public Transit Association and such, they compare unfavorably even to poorly run bus routes in the suburbs. So if you're doing a ride hailing per hour, you could max out at six riders per vehicle per hour. And even an off-peak suburban bus line, you could still get anywhere from six to 10. And then if you'd like to dive deeper, feel free to ask me any additional questions in the Q&A segment. Um, and now uh, let's uh, move on to what I'd like to uh, highlight for the purposes of this, call, this talk and uh, rethink uh, urban design. So to start here, if everyone could uh, see my uh, screen right here of this uh, map uh, produced by Transport analyst uh, Elon Levy, uh, pronouns they and them, non binary here. And what they uh, produced is an indicative uh, diagram of what the New York subway system right here and the regional rail system right here, including Metro North, New Jersey Transit, and Line Railroad along the path and others, what they would look like if we're able to get cost under control. And for those who tuned in yesterday, you did uh, hear me uh, briefing uh, during the fireside chat, during the panel session about how uh, Madrid were able to complete uh, 20 years ago, 75 kilometers of underground Metro in four years time at a cost that in the today's currency do not exceed 60 million per kilometer US dollars or 70 million if you include the rolling stock. So that's to give you some idea of what could uh, really be uh, possible under uh, cost control and such. So with that uh, preface um, in mind already, 
let's then uh, go briefly into uh, what uh, I am uh, currently uh, working on right here around uh, what is uh, we call the Sustainable Development Impact uh, Investment Finance Coalition. And it's a concept that has been uh, in mind on my end uh, for um, just, uh, just under three years now, uh, close to three, in which what uh, Stai was thanks to some uh, brainstorming with a good friend of mine who ran an architecture firm around uh, comprehensive and sustainable smart urban design. While well, I was looking into various uh, RFEIs as a request for expression of interest and RFPs, request proposals for all sorts of innovation hubs. So I think uh, tech hubs, life science hubs, cyber hubs, and uh, whatnot. Then uh, what um, I came across after looking upon site after site for those locations, bearing location efficiency and transactions in mind, is this provision called the uh, subway zoning bonus that is not actually too well known as I found out afterwards. But what it to provide is that in certain districts within the city of New York, if you are a developer, you could decide to upgrade or otherwise invest in a new subway station or extension that's adjacent to your property. And in exchange, you'd get typically 20%, but maybe a lot more depending on how much you invest and with the scope of your improvements into uh, how much a floor to area ratio or FAR you get. So for example, Citigroup, when they built um, their uh, new tower, well, now, uh, They've uh, sold it a few years ago, but uh, when they first built it in Lion City, 50 stories, 650 foot tall skyscraper, uh, you have probably seen it if you ever visit that area. They were able to do it because they had over one and a half million worth square feet worth of tradable development rights because of their agreement to fund three quarters the cost of building a tunnel between the Court Square stop on the uh, Crosstown line, the G train today, and the 23rd Street uh, Eli stop on the Queens Boulevard line, the E and F as we know it today. So, and there were about a dozen other uh, different cases of that. So what came to mind on my end was that what if you don't actually need a building planned? in order to create those stops, in order to have those bonuses. What if you can get those as of right? And secondly, that if you are a smaller developer, what if you can still get those bonuses, but because you don't have enough to invest up front, rather issue a minority equity share of your new property. Ideally, that share be commensurate with land value because that's what a public improvement is doing. It's increasing your land value, not necessarily your building value. To do that so that you can still get the liquidity. And then all of that share would be then held in a trust. We call it a community regeneration reinvestment trust or a public wealth trust in which uh, local residents uh, and uh, pensioners, savers in tri-state area could be able to invest uh, their uh, savings into for upgrading, uh, even upgrading infrastructure in their own uh, community. So if that could then be done at scale, then um, I figured, could that even be actual uh, well beyond the scope of what's possible in uh, New York, uh, other mega cities around the world, I think uh, London, Istanbul, even in uh, fast-growing the developing countries like uh, India or uh, Nigeria, as I alluded to also yesterday during the panel, for those of you who were with us uh, during that session. So on a fundamental level, it's about uh, just being able, uh, so not just the cost control, not just the value capture question, mix and match a plethora of uh, case studies of best practice from around the world, given New York is uh, roughly in between the size class of uh, Paris and Tokyo, of those two cities. 
And of, of those two, you could think of New York as having a uh, polycentric, increasingly a polycentric alignment as Tokyo has today, except uh, with a trans system that is designed more around uh, elite projection as opposed to uh, maximizing the user base, be more equitable around it and uh, also very similar to Paris in terms of how the employment is distributed, like a polycentric employment structure. So you could think of, if you're familiar with Paris, you have uh, the central district Paris, like Les Arrondissements, the central districts, and then a outlying business district of La Défense over to the Northwest, and a few others scattered around uh, Villette, the north, near the Northeast, Mont La Vallée, even further east, and the New York area, you could think of the equivalent such as Jamaica, Flushing, Jersey City, even Newark, you even think of those as outlying business districts, except that further out in the suburbs, because of planning that was very automobile and highway oriented, you have a lot less structured density further out in the suburbs, which tend not be conducive for driving a transit or ridership. So on a fundamental, on a very basic level, if we uh, refocus back in the tri-state area, you could think of the following, and which has effectively morphed into a uh, package. Uh, there would be blueprint of a COVID-19 uh, recovery package, which within the uh, next few weeks uh, before Christmas, actually working with one advisors to uh, Brooklyn Borough President-elect uh, Sean Donovan, and actually uh, hopeful for mayor of New York uh, for 2021 about uh, actually producing some type of a uh, platform around this. So while the lockdowns and other restrictions persist, it actually would buy us some time to refine this and actually be able to do it right instead of uh, rushing forward with it and uh, missing a few steps and uh, creating a sort of a trap as in how they built the Second Avenue subway uh, too deep and with only uh, two tracks instead of four, which is severely going to limit surface service if they decide to extend it south midtown. So you could think about the thing about this, all subway stops upgraded for universal accessibility, including platform screen doors, lifts to the platform and just IOT connectivity for wayfinding purposes and a million new location efficient uh, housing units created from tradable development rights linked to upgradation of those stops and preservation of uh, rent regulated units already. And at each of those stops, you could have, uh, as I alluded earlier, civic innovation and tech hubs so that you're effectively having a, a network of a public innovation infrastructure and they can even be made free at point of use if you generate enough uh, tradable development rights around those and what that would be in, would enable us to do is actually manage to depolarize a lot of the uh, politics you're seeing focused on uh, local action because of uh, such an approach would then manage to bring together, you can call it a grand bargain, as I've been equipping, tenant associations for supply affordable housing, the Real Estate Board of New York and other developers and owner associations for the real estate trade, buildings and construction trade unions as well, for decent work, transit advocates like strap hangers, transportation alternatives and those groups around the uh, inclusive uh, transit planning. And for development, also uh, location efficiency and even preserving re areas, municipal art society and the cultural associations for the quality of built environment, chambers of commerce and business owners associations around uh, promoting the region's economic vitality, and lastly, business improvement districts for regeneration and the reinvestment. So if you put all of these together, what you would actually have is effectively a doubling in the longer term and possibly a tripling in the near term of the city's uh, workforce. Currently, 
about a quarter million strong, involved with uh, architecture, engineering, and construction-related trades. So under that scenario, if you're able to boost workforce, boost employment by that level right there, that's already five to 10 percentage points not from the city's unemployment rate. So uh, even if uh, the tourism sector remains depressed for a few years, there'd still be plenty of some work. And if tourism sector, if that does come back in due course, then I don't think anyone here would seriously be, be complaining about a, a starting level compensation, regardless of industry of $20 an hour plus whatever benefits you get, because uh, that's right now the going rate for uh, non-union construction work, construction engineering work at the moment. So um, that's uh, setting the stage there. And all of that, um, then plus uh, the, if you add in all of these uh, extensions and other upgrades that uh, along a levy alluded to, it's going to take really no greater or very little greater than 10% uh, of the entire stock of all uh, savings, just all household savings in the New York City alone. If you brought it to the entire tri-state area, it's going to be less than 5% uh, of that. So think uh, 100 billion over uh, 10 to uh, 20 years to get everything extended and uh, upgraded. And uh, for um, all of those and the returns actually just Based on my uh, performer estimates, um, along with others, it should be uh, comparable to what uh, the teachers' retirement system, New York, the employees' retirement system, New York, uh, what those big pension boards already have for uh, targets. And what this could be coupled with, and for those of you tuning in who are involved those groups, it can easily be coupled with a movement to uh, promote uh, public banking and um, public wealth around the area. Because if you take all of uh, just New York City alone, New York City's uh, land, and take the indicative value of all uh, buildable public land, so in this case, you're excluding all parks and waterways, if you take the indicative value of all buildable public land at highest best use value, you'd have anywhere from one and a half to two trillion US dollars worth that can be leveraged into what you might call a New York sovereign fund that then can be used to underwrite things like not just the infrastructure improvements, but then also offer lines of credit to small developers, small business owners, or provide that to be able to streamline and expedite uh, economic uh, recovery post uh, COVID crisis. And um, for um, all of that, um, and that could also be partnered, uh, especially with uh, credit unions, uh, CDFIs, even Amalgamated Bank, all those groups, they can easily be brought in to uh, this type of uh, network here. So um, there's uh, plenty of scope we're exploring around uh, collaborations, around coalition building that can easily, it's really taking the best, uh, mixing and matching the best from around the world and then creating New York, shaping New York as a reference case that then can be positioned to be adapted into context across North America and potentially even uh, further abroad. And uh, then I would like to uh, point you, uh, lastly with this, this last point is point you to what would potentially be a viable, you can call it an initial operating segment or an uh, iOS, as they say in a shorthand. And that would most readily, and this would um, address this issue of what people call transit desert in southwestern Queens, which is really the only part of Queens where um, the other than the eastern parts, it's the only other part that is within uh, 15 to 30 minutes of all of the major uh, job centers in the city that still is outside of a 10 to 15 minute or half mile walk to the nearest uh, subway station. 
So along the um, lower Montauk line, um, to give you some history about it, it's uh, owned run by the Lion Railroad, uh, extending from Jamaica to Lion City. Used to be a main uh, commuter corridor uh, back when they were uh, taking commuters into Manhattan a century ago via car floats before the East River tunnels were constructed. And then ridership online of that line dropped over decades as industry, as uh, since over 100 years, moved away from waterfront sites. And that line was then closed in the 1990s because of declining ridership as more and more of the manufacturing in the area had moved out by then. So the opportunity there now, thanks to uh, advent of emerging technologies like, like additive manufacturing, think 3D printing and such, that you can now much more easily integrate small scale manufacturing into the urban fabric, which actually um, does provide an opportunity to position the Newtown Creek area. And that has also applicability to much of Bayonne and other places, similar places as well, as sites for integrating higher density uh, inclusive residential development with uh, light advanced manufacturing that could potentially anchor creation of decent jobs in those neighborhoods. So when you could have that framework in place, you would have, you'd then be able to extend um, that segment or even be able to do it once uh, cost control is in place, extend it under a midtown through uh, Grand Central. And already that can be uh, built into some of the uh, Midtown East uh, post rezoning proposals as in building provisions for extending a rapid transit line into the underground concourses of the new uh, super tall buildings that are being proposed there that would essentially turn Grand Central into much more of a gateway into uh, New York for arrivals. And then further west into um, the Times Square area through the Hudson over to the Meadowlands, which would then provide a viable and much higher capacity alternative as opposed to rebuilding uh, the Port Authority bus terminal on site. The terminal could then be uh, relocated further out. And then given that the number of passengers from uh, Port Authority bus terminal who'd be transferring to the subway anyway, it would actually get them onto their train uh, much more readily. And it's actually said that it's not that they're preferring to take the bus to uh, Port Authority bus terminal. They take it because the train is so uh, inconvenient to access as currently uh, structured. So already that would be a major improvement and just by indicative metrics, you're going to be able, even without that value capture from a new uh, prop development, which uh, could be uh, very substantial, could be uh, even in a down economy, could be worth 40 billion US dollars um, of uh, value capture right there of a new development right there on that corridor. Even with that, even without that, you're still going to be able to generate half a million uh, new riders a day, which means fare box recovery ratio of numbers 150% to 200%, which is now comparable to what you're finding in the better run areas of uh, Tokyo, Japan, uh, for instance. And uh, once you um, have that in place, once you have that, then if you work backwards to um, this uh, question of uh, cost control, if you were just based on building the second avenue line, if you were to build it how it should have been built, how you have designed it, without even touching any of the staffing and uh, contracting practices, though of course there's a lot of room for form there as well, just by design changes, you could actually reduce the cost instead of the second avenue line costing four billion as built it could have cost uh, no greater than uh, one and a quarter billion because much of the additional cost is actually from overbuilding stations of choosing to mine stations from underground 
as opposed to either building stations cut and cover from above, which means much quicker station construction, and then be traded off against potentially more extensive street level disruption. But instead of having five years disruption, you only get one to two years or going uh, deep uh, bore, um, large diameter bore underground and choosing to build a platforms within the tunnels because they're wide enough and then boring uh, narrow access shafts down those levels. So if you apply those uh, cost control approaches to a lower Montauk, you're talking about about 14 kilometers of uh, reactivations plus 10 kilometers of tunnels and then another 10 kilometers elevated over to uh, Rutherford, New Jersey across the Meadowlands. And along that stretch, and it should cost no greater than uh, 9 billion, maybe 10 if you if you have to duplicate electrification, if you want different trains with different electrification systems uh, running, or if you need to order new rolling stock that can run on multiple uh, voltages. But even at that, that would already be a significant improvement, which if you can then uh, address the uh, staffing contracting issues without having to cut any pay scales while maintaining the $100 an hour plus pay scales, you can still cut that cost by half even further. So all of this is indeed possible. It just uh, takes on a fundamental level the political will uh, to do so. So uh, in short, um, that is what we're planning. I expect a lot more to be uh, coming out and released over the coming weeks and months. It's uh, the uh, focal point of one of the uh, three main uh, work streams around my uh, life's work at this moment with my uh, Coalition of Willing, which is uh, fundamentally about being able to uh, recycle that uh, public wealth that you find in uh, land and other uh, public create value, be able to recycle all that public wealth instead of allowing it to be extracted, recycle it into uh, improvements in uh, public infrastructure, like uh, what I just uh, outlined in the past uh, 20 minutes. So say uh, that's about um, 20 minutes already. So I'd like to leave the rest of the time for some uh, Q&A here whether you're tuning in uh, directly here in the audience via the Zoom channel or you're from the other live channels, I'm open to questions. And then uh, also feel free to uh, reach me via LinkedIn through the Everything Urban Design event or even uh, search my name on uh, Google, you'll find my uh, profile uh, right there. So um, thank you very much and uh, looking forward to uh, questions and some uh, inform the discussion going forward. Yang Bo, thanks a lot so much. That was an amazing presentation. Lots of details to unpack. Obviously we have a wide range of audience uh, and I hope uh, a lot of these guys head to Wikipedia to double check a lot of this stuff. <laughs> but it's great stuff. Uh, and I think you're going to have a great time in the panel discussion since you're really transit oriented and so is VIA. And uh, I think it's going to be a very, very awesome conversation. As always, audience, thank you so much for joining us here live, broadcasting directly from uh, Zoom, uh, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to ask questions via any of our social medias. We're ready to go ahead and answer them. All right, we're moving on to our next topic. So our next speaker will be Mariela Alfonso from State of Place. We'll begin this uh, presentation at 11 o'clock. I'm Mariela Alfonso, founder and CEO of State of Place. I grew up in Miami, Florida. Not the glitzy, glamorous Miami Vice Miami or welcome to Miami, Miami. My Miami, the real Miami, it was exhilarating, but for all the wrong reasons. Growing up in my Miami was terrifying. As a carless teenager, I was forced to play a cruel real life version of a video game, type roping down pencil thin sidewalks, dodging cars as I crossed strip mall line highways, masquerading as city streets, all to get to a chicken teriyaki sub. But the stakes, 
The stakes were much higher than that, as I learned way too early at the funeral of my 15-year-old friend who lost her life playing that game. So yeah, I've been a bit obsessed over the past 20 years advocating for better places. And while I have plenty of passion to fill an infinite number of Miamis, as a social scientist at heart, I didn't want to just dogmatically tell people that good design was better for us or even what good design was. Instead, I decided to prove to people that design mattered using, well, evidence. First, I started by quantifying what we even meant by good urban design, so I could then tie that back to its health and community benefits. But turns out that arguing that good urban design has social value fell mostly on deaf ears. I soon realized that my real estate friends, developers, investors, brokers, you know, the ones with power, they were the ones I needed to convince. And they frankly told me, Mariela, you just have to show us the money. The only argument they were going to be swayed by, the only way they would consider design in the equation was to quantify its economic value. So that's exactly what I did. Several years later, not only had I evolved and iterated my algorithm to quantify urban design, now known as state of place, I showed them the money, big time. In fact, I found that increasing a neighborhood's state of place by 20 points out of 100 was tied to premiums of over $9 a square foot for office rent, seven for retail, an 80% bump in retail revenues, a $300 unit increase in residential rents, an $80 square foot increase for residential for sale values. And guess what? In the meantime, walkability hit the mainstream. Today, everyone wants access to livable, equitable, sustainable places. People want to live where they can walk. Firms want to locate where their employees can walk. People want to shop and walk. And many other studies have shown them that money. But this isn't just about hipsters or empty nesters getting to live in cool, trendy neighborhoods. Walkability, quality of life, is no longer a nice to have. Because every 25 seconds, someone dies in a traffic collision. Because every year we spend over 31 trillion treating chronic diseases tied to sedentary lifestyles. Because one in six deaths is tied to pollution. These costs of poor urban design have been clear and significant for a long time. And yet many were still blind to them. Until 2020, the year that changed our normal. COVID-19 has served as an ugly magnifier of long existing structural inequities and spatial injustices. Turns out that the lack of those same urban design features that impacted quality of life pre-COVID led to many of the pre-existing conditions, the comorbidities that COVID preyed so mercil mercilessly upon. Indeed, in the US, 3.4 times more black people and 3.3 more Latinos have died from COVID-19 than have white people. Couple those spatial injustices with the systemic racism that plagues the US and many other nations to this day, we can afford to go back to normal. We must chart out a new normal that it creates more inclusive, equitable, just places that we can all love. But how do we get there? Well, let's start by asking ourselves, how did we end up here? Why have we been designing cities like this? Why have we and our cities been held hostage by the car? Why the lack of dignity in planning? Why are we not heeding calls for people first places? Wallets would benefit from them. Hearts would be so happier and healthier with them. The earth is suffering without them, so why? Why are cities still falling short globally in light of all this evidence about the exponential power of place? Because the city-making process is broken. The city-making process is based on intuition with no evidence. It's based on beautiful images with no data. It seeks public approval without public participation. It's done inside the building, not outside the building. It seeks expert opinion without considering resident-led solutions. Quite simply, the city-making process is a top-down, ideologically-based, expert-driven approach accessible only to a few, and it's failing us. Let's take the case of the city of Winnipeg in Canada. Long time ago, they decided that this intersection, poorly designed to begin with, was too dangerous for pedestrians, so they closed it off to folks and made them go underground to cross. Fast forward 30 years, they get a new mayor. He vows to reopen the intersection to pedestrians, but first they have to commission a study. They put out a request for proposals to find the consultant to do it. Price tag, 100,000. Year later, the report comes out, but it just collects dust. Five years later, around re-election time, someone dusts off the study, but it's too old. They need a new one and with it, a new request for proposals. They choose the usual suspects and spend another 70K. It's still a car first place. Bottom line, almost all planning and development decisions start with intuition and gut. 
what projects to create, what neighborhoods to focus on, which proposals to prioritize, approve, fund. The product is a plan with beautiful pictures. The process is slow and expensive. And then there's the opposition, who is either armed with data to show why your project is too costly, too frivolous, not up to code, will create traffic, or simply wants to be convinced. Pretty pictures alone don't win this battle. They don't show whether the project makes sense fiscally or why it's even the right project for the community. So you have a process where the beautiful plan collects dust and somehow this crazy eyesore is totally cool. But this is not okay. The most frustrating part of it, data is on the city maker side. There's actual evidence that can prove which plan is better. So speaking of data, you might be thinking, well, what about the smart city movement? Yes, it has definitely introduced data into the city making equation, but it's only telling cities how they're performing today and not how to become the cities they aspire to be. They're focused on quantifying problems like traffic, not on solutions to those problems. It's like being able to predict if you'll get a terminal disease, but stopping short of telling you what to do if you get it or how to prevent it, period. This is where state of place comes in. We've distilled 20 years of social science-based evidence into an AI-driven urban design data and predictive analytics software that quantifies what people love about places and automatically recommends ways to make them more walkable, livable, sustainable, while maximizing return on investment, or ROI. We help cities and developers use data to find the most effective and cost-efficient ways to unlock maximum social, environmental, health, and economic value via urban design changes and then use that data to make the investment case for those changes by quantifying their ROI. To date, we've collected data on nearly 40,000 blocks amounting to over 7 million data points in over 400 neighborhoods across almost 150 cities in 16 countries. And more importantly, we've helped nearly 40 cities and developers use that data to get awesome places people love done. Take the city of Tigard, a suburb near Portland. They have a vision to become the most walkable city in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. While a traditional consultant created a plan for them, they didn't really know where to start or how to get buy-in for their projects. So how does a state of place help a city like Tigard? First, we extract data from digital imagery on over 290 urban design features like sidewalks, benches, and trees, and aggregate that into a score from 0 to 100 using our IP based on over 20 years of research to get the baseline state of place index. Now the city can use the software to see scores for all the blocks, as well as a breakdown of scores along 10 urban design dimensions empirically tied to walkability and livability. This allows cities to objectively identify the various assets and needs of their blocks in great detail to see what was working and what wasn't and why they got the score that they got. The software also generates heat maps to help the city start to prioritize blocks and project areas within the redevelopment district. The software also helps you tap into analytics regarding all of the urban design features we collect so they can get an assessment of the whole project area as well as block by block. Now, because our forecasting models show that some urban design features matter more than others depending on what outcomes you actually want to deliver, the city doesn't just have to focus on the lowest performing areas of urban design. Instead, they could generate custom recommendations based on their specific goals like walkability. And because some urban design dimensions are harder to adjust than others, they're able to tailor the recommendations based on what they're feasibly able to change, as well as identify the changes they can make that will have the most impact given their current performance, goals, and capacity. So while the software is data-driven, it's not formula-based. This is about figuring out how to be your best you. They then used our SimCity scenario tool to determine how various plans and proposals might increase their state of place the most. And in the case of one proposal with two alternatives, a simple revamp of an existing medical facility versus a mixed use version, while they normally would have had to use the anecdotal evidence or point to other communities to make the case for the mixed use version, they used our software to show not only that the mixed use version would lead to a higher state of place index, but because our forecasting models tie state of place to higher real estate values, they calculated the ROI of each scenario and showed that the mixed use version had a higher ROI, even though the project was more costly. But guys, this is just the beginning. Data-driven city making is going to change the world. We're charting a data-driven path for city making from cradle to cradle by quantifying the exponential power of place. So what if cities didn't come to us already with projects in mind? 
What if they were able to tap into data for their entire city from day one and then use that data to begin to identify where to focus? So much of this is politically driven right now. So much of today's process is inherently inequitable. Imagine a world in which neighborhoods that really needed it were identified objectively with data and they were the ones the city focused on first. And what if all requests for proposals, competitions, and projects submitted to cities for approval or funding were required to increase quality of place and actually make places better and more sustainable? Imagine a world where all projects that came to life were truly designed for people and by people. Imagine a world in which we actually knew the answers to simple questions like which of our city blocks have sidewalks or where could we use more lighting or which curb cuts need improvements. And what if everyone looking to move to a new neighborhood or looking to locate their firms or visiting a city for the first time could just access the state of place index for the entire city immediately. Imagine a world where data could help us find the place that would make us happiest. Imagine a world where we can make people's heart smiles with evidence-based design. Well, that world is here. Now, we've developed visual machine learning models to automatically extract our data from digital imagery. First, we gather millions of street level images for all blocks in your region, process them with our thousands of machine learning models, collecting hundreds of data points like trees, outdoor dining, benches, land uses for each street. This means that instead of taking 20 to 25 minutes to get data for every block, it takes hours to get data for an entire city. We debuted this in March, collecting data for the entire city of Grand Rapids in Michigan. With this tech, not only can we cover an entire city, we can cover all of the US and eventually map the entire world's state of place. And you can easily dig deep into all the data to assess needs, prioritize changes, imagine possibilities, and optimize value. This means, yes, not only can you identify the neighborhoods that need the most help and what kind of help that is, but you can also inform your budgets from the start. You can plan for better transit connections. You can analyze your entire portfolio and target markets to find the best upside opportunities. And you can compare neighborhoods to those all over the world. And what if we could tie a state of place to more than just economics? What if we could show how simply making places better can help, well, save I'm Mariela Alfonso, founder and CEO, which we actually knew the answers to simple questions like which of our city blocks have sidewalks or where could we use more lighting or which curb cuts need improvements? And what if everyone looking to move to a new neighborhood or looking to locate their firms or visiting a city for the first time could just access the state of place index for the entire city immediately? Imagine a world where data could help us find the place that would make us happiest. Imagine a world where we can make people's heart smiles with evidence-based design. Well, that world is here. Now, we've developed visual machine learning models to automatically extract our data from digital imagery. First, we gather millions of street level images for all blocks in your region, process them with our thousands of machine learning models, collecting hundreds of data points like trees, outdoor dining, benches, land uses for each street. This means that instead of taking 20 to 25 minutes to get data for every block, it takes hours to get data for an entire city. We debuted this in March, collecting data for the entire city of Grand Rapids in Michigan. With this tech, not only can we cover an entire city, we can cover all of the US and eventually map the entire world's state of place. And you can easily dig deep into all the data to assess needs, prioritize changes, imagine possibilities, and optimize value. This means, yes, not only can you identify the neighborhoods that need the most help and what kind of help that is, but you can also inform your budgets from the start. You can plan for better transit connections. You can analyze your entire portfolio and target markets to find the best upside opportunities. And you can compare neighborhoods to those all over the world. And what if we could tie a state of place to more than just economics? What if we could show how simply making places better can help, well, save the world while making us safer, healthier, happier? Well, with our data automation, we can now more easily show how state of place is indeed tied to the quadruple bottom line. So first we started by asking ourselves, what if we could show that urban design was a matter of life and death? What if we could show how increasing state of place could help eliminate road deaths and actually achieve vision zero goals? Imagine a world where design could get us to zero. Well, that's here too. We collected state of place data for a sample of blocks in Nor Durham, North Carolina, focused on 60 collision sites and the blocks adjacent to them, the known hotspots, and compared them to a random sample of blocks within our current database. 
we found that quality of place as measured by state of place was indeed a matter of life and death. In fact, we found that for every one point increase on the state of place index, the odds of a collision were reduced by 12.3% on average. We've also quantified the links between health and state of place in China. We collected data for three neighborhoods in Shanghai across three levels of walkability, analyzed how their state of place impacted the amount of walking residents reported. And we found that people that lived in places with an above average state of place walked on average 22 more minutes per week. And speaking of health, we're now using our automated data collection in the city of Philadelphia to quantify the links between urban design as measured by state of place and COVID, including the pre-existing health conditions that COVID preys upon that were tied to the built environment conditions in vulnerable neighborhoods pre-COVID. This way, the city can identify the people and places that need the most help to prevent future disasters and help them cope with COVID better now. And what if we showed how increasing state of place helped mitigate climate change by decreasing vehicle miles traveled, improving air quality, and lowering greenhouse gas emissions? Well, we're working to put place directly in the middle of the climate change conversation by forecasting how state of place impacts vehicle miles traveled throughout California, focusing on how this impacts vulnerable communities in particular. Because once again, city makers need this data to not only find the best ways to mitigate climate change, but prove that you can't fight the good fight simply by making tech enhanced cars. And of course, the goal is to use this data driven city making approach to help us achieve UN sustainable development goals and save our planet. And ultimately, what if people could get involved in city making without having to wait for cities to come to them? What if our scenario tool included a fun, easy 3D modeler that could be used by everyone and anyone? And what if our software gave regular people options of what could be? Imagine a world where people are not just complaining about the things they don't like, but are able to submit vetted solutions to cities and heck straight to developers with their state of place index and corresponding ROI. Yeah, we're building that too. State of place is more than just a startup. State of place is the embodiment of 20 plus years of passion, perseverance, and data geekdom. State of place is born out of a sincere desire to make these 20 plus years accessible at scale. Not to the few, but to the many. State of place is a rebuke of top-down, ideologically based, dogmatic, star architect driven city making. State of place isn't simply seeking to become the de facto data-driven decision and communication city making tool. State of place is seeking to fundamentally, fundamentally disrupt the do as I say because I know I'm right, do as he says because of who he is, do as they did because look how cool what they did is mentality that pervades the city making process. For me, that's the real opportunity for smart cities. Using data driven city making to create happy places is worth infinitely more than the simple zeros and ones behind the smart city movement. State of place will make the data driven justification, the data driven city making the new normal, not simply because in data we trust, but because data driven city making is the best means to the end of reclaiming our streets for people to the end of making all our pockets more full, of making our hearts happier, of making our planet healthier, to the end of building a world in which we can all live in truly exhilarating places we can't get enough of, to the end of getting awesome places people love done, so that I, we, can change the beginning of my story to growing up in Miami was simply amazing. Let's use data to create awesome, happy places all people can access and love. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Mariela. Uh, she's not here at the moment as far as I can see, but she's here in spirit. If you have any questions for her, please as always submit your questions through any of their feedback um, social media links. We're ready to take them on. Uh, we will be going into break after this one. We had a technical issue with Joshua Arma. He is in the jungle in Hawaii. He's having a great time, but unfortunately not great internet connection. So we will be uh, pushing his talk a little back after the panel. We'll be heading into the break uh, shortly, uh, but keep in mind that we'll be returning at one o'clock for the panel discussion. And the panel discussion will include Marcus, Joshua Arma, and Mariela Alfonso. Should be an interesting talk. Should be an interesting data-driven talk. Uh, I look forward to it.
All right. I'd like everyone to uh, turn on their cameras, turn on their mics. We're about to start the panel. Okay, great. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Nicholas Musa, and today's panel includes Marcos Diamond, Business Development Lead for VIA, Joshua Arma, Chief Data Scientist at Waze Research, Mariela Alfonso, Founder and CEO of State of Place, and Yang Bo Du is joining us from yesterday's panel. Uh, he is from the Sustainable Development Investment Finance Coalition. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, a bit of a COVID question. Uh, lockdowns have hurt many big, big businesses and small businesses, and it seems that we're approach approaching a possible large-scale lockdown with LA already imposing new strict guidelines for essentially all human interaction. Um, also, many people are moving out of urban communities for cheaper housing due to the telecommuting. What do you think urban communities will look like in a post-COVID world and in the near future through these lockdowns? Well, um, shall I um, open this? Uh, so just to Ryan Sight, a good way of framing this uh, current uh, COVID crisis is let's to treat it as any type of an uh, unprecedented event or any type of a game-changing event, given that if you look through human history uh, since the uh, Black Death and even prior and after, lately even uh, in the 1918 uh, flu pandemic, 1957, 68 additional pandemics, 2005, avian influenza. So humanity has dealt with these uh, pandemics in the past uh, quite uh, several times. That said, from what we can see here, more so you could say that trends that many had already been predicting for the past uh, decade and even two decades have just moved forward to probably five, if not even uh, 10 years. So for example, increasingly you're seeing a lot of businesses uh, becoming, uh, just bringing digital transformation, think connected companies, social business, all those buzzwords you've been hearing over the past decade they're coming even more rapidly in the mainstream, so accelerating that uh, given the exigencies. Though just looking even at the uh, data right now from what you're seeing is, I'd say overall to preface in short, it's still very early to tell what the actual trends are going to be, how actually COVID's impact things because thanks to lockdowns, a lot of the movements say whether it's uh, moving a house or uh, anything, chances are that it was just because of lockdown, because of the activity has been so depressed for so long, it's just a pent up uh, demand, things that were being planned anyway, and many were just uh, waiting until things decided to act on it. Though to give you some broad overview of what you might expect to happen. So with telecommuting, chances are, First is at least half, more like three quarters in a working class heavy metro like New York could not physically be done remotely, especially essential workers, whether services or manufacturing. And then even those who can work remotely, there's a good chance it'll be a split in terms of flex work given that uh, remote work, it's very good. If all you're doing is coding or sales calls, yes, you can do all of that remotely. However, if you're in a much more innovative capacity that requires a lot more face-to-face -face interaction, much more of these serendipitous interactions, then yes, you still need the proximity of the ordinary in order to be most effective. So you're not going to see much of an effect um, except that the margins or maybe instead of 5% telecommuting, you may see 10, possibly 15, maybe 20, depending on your metro area. But so that's still not going to be sufficient to uh, really make create too much change on patterns. What may change, though, is a shift from very peak heavy commuting patterns to uh, all day commuting as work hours become increasingly uh, flexible. 
And then you'll also see that uh, flood spill over into office space, such as you're going to see a lot more demand for, say, office space that it's a green, uh, LEED certified, even well certified. So it's built around and designed around human health. Hmm. See more of that in demand. And then if you have class B or class C, expect the bottom fell out of uh, those segments. So probably a lot more residential conversions, or if the value is high enough, uh, as in much of Midtown East, even complete reconfiguring of those office blocks into buildings with uh, much um, taller uh, ceilings, uh, okay. more open floor so plates and all of that. So just acceleration of trends that you've already been seeing at that uh, over the last uh, decade and two. Okay, so you see that you see think like, you think that there's probably not going to be too much of a change. Not directly from COVID, but more so the interplay between COVID as a shock. It could have been any type of socioeconomic environmental shock, could have been oil shock, whatnot. But it's really a shock that's really triggering acceleration of the uh, various trends that have already been in play for the last uh, several it. decades. Great. Thank you. Uh, just to also, you know, uh, speak on this a little bit, the one piece that he kind of talked about, which was uh, relevant, is that uh, people, you know, most people rely on small businesses for employment. And one of the bigger trends that you need to pay attention to right now is the fact that there's been a lot of civil unrest. What will the world look like, especially urban cities in America, when people do not abide by the, the guidelines, right? And through that, you also have to remember that there's issues that are not going to solve themselves. For instance, people that live in urban communities in low income housing cannot afford to move. They're not going anywhere. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to either one, figure out ways to survive, and then two, speak their mind. But on the flip side of that, there's also the issue of, 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 of income, right? So when you don't have, you got to pay attention more to where small business is going. If small business evaporates, such like right now in San Francisco, a lot of businesses are shutting down for good now. This second shutdown is shutting down San Francisco businesses. In places like New Jersey, New York, when you shut down these businesses, they're not going to be able to bounce back. So when you have that problem, the city now has to take on this liability. Like an, an example of this has been um, the mayor of Compton gave... A, you know, a, a long-term $800 a month to people in income-based housing. This is a female African-American mayor in Compton, California. She did somewhat of the first uh, universal basic income that has been known from a government standpoint, but by mayor. She's guaranteeing the funds through private philanthropy and city dollars. So how does it look like for cities to support local ecosystems so they could prevent civil unrest, right? And the second side of that is corporate social responsibility. For instance, you have places like uh, the Los Angeles Clippers. They built, they're building a huge stadium in Inglewood, California, but are also contributing over $100 million to local economic development for the local businesses and the local residents. So what, do you look, what does that look like when you have like the New York, uh, the, the New York Giants in East Rutherford, New Jersey, you know, and other teams that play in New Jersey, even in our labor as New York, how do they contribute to the local ecosystem? Because the football season is happening right now. So there's different ways to integrate value that isn't necessarily going to be uh, new for us. Like, oh, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and say, wow, you know, a lot of things have changed. What we will do is wake up and see cities destroyed by civil unrest. We've already witnessed this. Not only did COVID happen, you know, a lot of cities were burnt to the ground, to be honest. And when I say burnt to the ground, I'm talking about small businesses. And, you know, that's really the key for the employment sector. We look at a lot of these small rural towns and urban cities. So it's really going to be interesting to see, like, how do we manage the temperature checks of America and low-income housing citizens that will not be able to fight against the issues that come from, you know, everything being uh, put on pause again. Yeah, I mean, just to echo what you said, Joshua, I mean, from, from my perspective, I've, I've actually been working for the last several months with the city of Philadelphia um, via state of place. And one thing that has been very clear um, 
since the pandemic and since the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, protests that really started this summer or escalated this summer, um, you know, that equity is no longer a nice to have, you know, it is absolutely front and center and the city doesn't feel like, I mean, they never felt like they could ignore it, but now it's, it's become, you know, priority number one and, and it, and it pervades all different aspects of the departments that I've been working with. So, uh, from the smart city department, who's, who, who we have the contract with, but also, uh, to public health, of course, to, um, the Office of Violence um, Prevention in the city of Philadelphia, um, to their streets department, urban planning, um, sort of the, you know, all the other usual suspects. But what, what I've found is that, um, you know, this equity issue, it pervades so many different facets of, um, you know, quality of life that kind of touches upon so many different departments within the city that I do think that this is going to propel them to work uh, more across boundaries, uh, which is really a necessary solution to, um, to, to address these, these spatial injustices um, that, that COVID just served to, to exacerbate and magnify in a really ugly way, right? Um, so, you know, in terms of sort of the minutia, urban patterns and things like that, you know, I, I agree with Yangbo, like a lot of that stuff might be temporary or might, or they might have already been happening. So like, I have friends who left the city of New York, um, you know, because the rents were high, right. And the amenities were, were lacking, um, you know, so they wouldn't have left in 2020, but maybe they would have left in 2022, right. Um, and so, and so, and, and there's some people that they absolutely see this as temporary and plan to come back because they, you know, enjoy, um, the urban amenities, but, you know, that just speaks to privilege, right? So it, it, I think that this goes back to my original point around equity is like, there's plenty of people, the majority of people haven't been migra migrating and it's not because they don't want to necessarily, it's because they can't. And that's the least of their worries that there's, you know, the urban amenities are gone. <laughs> they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to get food on the table and how to, you know, curb against um, food, uh, rather uh, housing insecurity. I have a question on that then. If, if people are willing to move, but they can't move, should the government make a fund that helps people move out of their city? I mean, I don't think that the that people are wanting to move and can't move. It's it's you know there. All of this just does is you know look at sort of the importance and influence of hyperlocal environments, right? And so there's been decades, centuries in in the U.S. where there's been concentration of spatial injustices because of the lack of amenities. Um, that are found hyper locally. Normally, you know, outside of a pandemic, um, there's other ways to access transportation that can help you, you know, bridge that divide and and find access to um, the the kinds of things, the kinds of services and amenities needed that are not in current in certain vulnerable neighborhoods. Um, and and that's already an undue burden because they should be in those neighborhoods. And transportation access is often quite lacking. Um, however, you know, now that with the pandemic, that's just, you know, it's concentrated, that's where they're at. And, and it's not so much that, um, you know, I can't speak for them. I'm not Sam, I have no idea whether they want to move or not, but I don't think that that's the, the, the issue. It's the issue is strengthening the neighborhoods, um, reinvesting in those neighbors. And, and I, in my opinion, prioritize just those neighborhoods first. Yeah, and to echo that uh, further, um, there's actually um, a case study that should be a cautionary tale to anyone who uh, still, and it's been uh, tried for uh, generations, this notion that the government should incentivize certain forms of uh, settlement patterns. Um, and it's uh, if you take uh, Germany, how um, they, um, against much political opposition, how they manage to resettle a refugee flow that within one year or two was a little over 10% of 1% of their population, nearly a million refugees within a year. And after two years, what ended up happening despite promises, still 80% of them had no permanent employment after two years. And the issue was the fundamental issue that many I felt glossed over was 
And it's also happened in places like uh, France, Belgium, Sweden for decades, not just for refugees, but also for economic migrants as well, that the places where they settled to, they thought, well, if we settle those people in these somewhat um, economically backward areas in uh, Eastern Germany, many places have lost up to 10 or 20% of their population since the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1989, that they're going to recover. But no, there is a good reason why some places remain depressed. There has to be a lot more of the granular ground up approach necessary as opposed to just thinking that here uh, you draw some lines on a map, uh, make an aerial view of a city or a region, and things will actually uh, turn out well. Like you can't just do that. People are not particles here, they're independent agents. And even a long running case study is that they've been trying to decentralize and disperse London for over a century, ever since the Garden City movement. And really all that's caused is for anywhere in the Southeast of England to be unaffordable to anyone who's below the upper middle class uh, income, uh, income decile. So it's really going back to a reframing around, right? So where do people want to go? What do they want to do? Just start with that, improving their community themselves. So just what do they need right now in their community and focus on that as opposed to presupposing some ideal top-down approach and imposing it. One quick tidbit since you mentioned that is that, you know, looking at New Jersey, for instance, is the most condensely populated state in, the, in America, right? And the bigger problem that we have for specifically in like New Jersey is that there's chemical plants that exist that are contributing to people catching uh, uh, diseases that are influenced from the air quality. Philadelphia has this problem with low income neighborhoods near chemical plants. And when you have aging populations that are not able to just up and leave, you have a bigger issue. And with coastal cities right now, there's a federal mandate to adjust rising sea levels, which is essentially lifting homes, right? Raising houses, right? Now, when federal dollars are distributed to uh, go after these uh, issues, and let's say homeowners are giving these dollars, do you think the person that has been dealing with the pandemic and they just got thirty thousand dollars to remodel their house because they could literally get a uh, imminent domain if they don't will spend that money on raising their house on economic needs? The problem is stewardship with federal and, and local resources. When you look at that, there's two bigger uh, pressing needs right now. One is you can't put uh, a bunch of baby boomers in a casket yet. We are still dealing with the future longevity. People are fighting to stay alive. They want to be alive another 20, 30 years. They want to stay in their hometown and their local neighborhoods. They don't want to up and leave. So when you look at that, it's going to be a stability crisis. Who is, when New Jersey has the highest population of millennials that live at home with their parents. Where, in, in, the, in the country that is, right? So where are these millennials going to go if their parents say, you know what, we can't afford to have you no more. We have res constraint resources. You need to figure it out. You're going to have a stability issue with who is a creditworthy buyer in a post-COVID economy that obviously is going to have higher restrictions on who to lend to? And then on the flip side, for the aging populations that are stable, how do they maintain what they have without losing it? Because they, number one, have to keep up with federal mandates and other issues that happen to prevent eminent domain, especially in places like New Jersey, deal with this all the time. You know, you look at coastal cities, they have a lot of changing uh, dynamics that push people out, whether you like it or not. And that doesn't allow you to enjoy the, 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 the pursuit of happiness. So I would just challenge us to think, how do aging populations up and leave places that they've been for 60 years without the resources? And two, how do we create stewardship with federal and local resources so that those that are younger can have bridges to go over? Yeah, I actually, that's part of Rethink Urban Design. Now that you mentioned this particular issue, it seems like something we will be tackling because we solve that issue. We will rebuild their homes. We will take advantage of those federal grants. We will steward that entire process and we won't have to do it kicking them out. Obviously they'll have to leave during construction phase, but they'll be back at home when this is done. Um, that's kind of the whole point of what Rethink Urban Design is trying to do in general. So that's a very interesting point. 
Very, very, very interesting point. I know that uh, there was this issue to be tackled, but it looks like a brand new market for me and Nicholas to, you know, take a look. Yeah, and touching back upon the uh, uh, the mayor in Compton, basically giving them uh, universal basic income. How do you see uh, governments being able to help those without giving universal basic income? Because universal basic in income is a very hot topic and both sides are either very pro or very against. And I feel like there has to be some middle ground or something else that can be done in order for um, these people to get what they need. Workforce development, when it happened back during uh, the Industrial Revolution, the second Industrial Revolution, when car manufacturing erupted, right? They, ahead of time, before they wrote these cars, they trained the workforces all around the country. And then you look at places like, people call, talk about Silicon Valley, Detroit was Silicon Valley during that time. Camden, right? New Jersey as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Camden, New Jersey as well, and other places like that. But the problem is right now, we can't, you know, um, you know, magically make people upskill overnight. So I think it's more like I said, creating a bridge. You have to give people runway to be able to upskill. And you kind of like you got you have to start like forcing the same careers on people. And it's a generational thing. It might take a whole generation to really catch up to where uh, the world is going, right? Because you got to think about it. New Jersey is in 1990s, 2000s technology, while some cities are in 2020, right? or 2010s. So there's different legacy environments that we're holding on to that, and our crippling infrastructure is really the bigger problem because, you know, there's no way to address, uh, universal basic income is the same thing like looking at cryptocurrency. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an innovative idea, right? And the idea can be utilized if the, if the, if the efficacy is there. So for some people that need the universal basic income is, going to help keep crime low, to be honest. That's really where you're looking at. It's not really about the money. It's about, you know, this money's going to go to somewhere anyways, right? And we need to prevent crime and other issues because these people are not highly skilled workers yet. They're not knowledge workers, right? And on the flip side, for people that don't need universal basic income, they need incentives. They don't need the income necessarily from the universal basic income, but they need the, 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 the tax breaks. They need other things that cost, you know, money, right? Or that, you know, Make, make governments make decisions faster when it comes to like increasing population. And one place you've seen like this is the state of Oklahoma. You know, a nonprofit, not the state itself, a nonprofit from Oklahoma was, is offering people ten thousand dollars to move there, right? Now that's not universal basic income. That's an incentive, right, to move to a low cost area in the in the country. So it's going to be interesting to see how we, uh, may you know kind of proliferate that idea of what it means to live in New Jersey. Like for instance, near the Hudson River, where the average rent is three to five thousand dollars, one to three bedroom, and you know, universal basic income wouldn't, wouldn't be enough to pay rent anyway. So, how do you create incentives for those that can't afford to to to, to you know, kind of like deal with inflation? But those that can't, they still they, they're going to need a bridge because it's just not enough time at the moment to uh, give them. Yeah, and on this question of incentives, uh, glad you brought it up because what many have been overlooking in all these debates about equity as well. And that this also ties into this uh, issue of reparations for legacy of uh, slavery that has exploded amid the uh, George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor protests, uh, all of that, is that these incentives, well, we talk about incentives, UBI and such, well, they've been handed out for decades already. The fund's already there. It's just not going to the groups that would benefit most from funding. It's going to groups that don't even need the funding. So one example that's very common across the states is what's called a TIF or a tax increment financing. So for those of you who are new to the concept is very quickly, what it is is that you want to invest in area, but the private sector is not uh, willing. So what you would do is you borrow, you issue bonds against future property tax revenues from whatever new development you expect the private sector to conduct by going there. And then once those revenues are realized, you start paying off those bonds. 
And there's a strict so-called but for criteria, as in but for this incentive, this development would not have uh, happened. And in a case study put together by this national nonprofit surround towns focused on Kansas City, overlaid with uh, maps of how the city was uh, redlined back in the 1930s and 40s. And what they noted were that over three quarters, like overwhelmingly, these tax and crime financing districts were in the non-redlined areas of the city. So you had decades worth, so, and even if you tally those up, they were saying in some of those places it was up to 30 million worth of tax revenues that otherwise would have went to these erstwhile red line neighborhoods, but now transferred over to the more affluent areas that did get those incentives. So the money is already there and there's no even need for the federal government to intervene in reparations either. It's that most local governments, city and states across the country already have those tools at their disposal. They just have to redirect it. So for example, one easy way to direct it, especially if you're trying to preserve the urban fabric, revitalize the inner city areas is, let's say someone has an old building, they have trouble maintaining it. Well, give that owner a tax break so that the building does not get demolished and replaced with the surface parking lot. That building gets maintained and possibly renovated for a higher use. That's just one of many examples. So the f resources are already there. They just have to be redirected. For me, I see this issue of uh, UBI is kind of one, one way to address what's really much more of a systemic issue, right? Um, and so I, I would frame this around, you know, how do we address this understanding first people's lived experiences and validating their traumas and focus on healing in addition to the economic um, healing that we would be providing via UBI and things like that. Um, and, and again, centered around equity and, and justice. And I, you know, I say this because this issue that's been exacerbated this year, um, or these various issues of, of spatial injustices that have been exacerbated this year, um, are very much tied to the links between land use, housing, and transportation um, that have exacerbated um, issues of inequity in, in the past. So for example, the fact that um, education, uh, school, school, school districts are funded by local property taxes you are essentially from the moment you are born, you are then predetermined to have access to lower quality education. And that is the antithesis of what we say, you know, we're providing in this country. It's sort of like everybody has the same opportunity to, you know, uh, pull themselves up from the bootstraps. And that's just not the case and hasn't been the case, frankly, ever uh, for a majority of, of um, you know, vulnerable populations in, in, in the US. So I think addressing that from a policy perspective, um, although it's not gonna have an immediate impact, um, it is an important way to make sure that this isn't something that continues um, so that they do have access to same quality education. Um, and with that, it's the same thing in, in terms of mobility, right? Um, and it, it's the same thing with what you were talking about, Joshua, with workforce development. So when you have um, areas of of cities that are underinvested, historically underinvested, it hits all aspects of people's lives from their education to the environmental quality to access to transit or whether a place is walkable or not. Um, it's, it's all related. So in my opinion, we have to, you know, absolutely this involves infrastructure, but thinking about infrastructure in a completely different way, you know, than, than what we normally hear our politicians talk about roads and bridges and things like that. Of course, that's part of it. We, we need you know, to have roads <laughs> to, to drive on, but, you know, there's so much more to infrastructure than just those two very obvious um, things. And, and it all goes back to, it must go back to this tie between land use, housing and, and transportation, in, in my opinion. And then just to throw out this real quick, uh, without talking about too long, uh, Asheville, North Carolina is a first real case study of not reparations, but of a municipal city targeting uh, urban development in its uh, underrepresented neighborhoods, not only through opportunity zones, but by attracting private sector investment in these areas and creating these uh, city dollars 
that are funding, you know, development, right? To increase the opportunities for home values to go up and other things to increase. And when you look at private wealth like California, when tech companies built their campuses in Silicon Valley, it increased the value of real estate for homeowners. I mean, by, you know, multiples, right? So there's a lot of value in uh, what Asheville, North Carolina is doing right now on a city level, on a municipal level that is representing with, uh, with, with, uh, is being talked about now, uh, especially what um, Mariella has just talked about. You said it was in, in Asheville in North Carolina? Yes, Asheville, North Carolina has not reparations with people calling the first wave of municipal uh, action on these issues with investing in their urban infrastructure and their urban uh, communities through, you know, you know, over a hundred million dollar uh, effort, which is also being matched through private sector uh, investment to build out resources and community investment so that people can uh, move things forward and benefit from that gentrification. Have many companies already started uh, like taking advantage of that? It's a, it's, it happened during this year. So I don't think it's going to oh, okay. happen fast, but it's a, a case study, right? Something that's real. It's out there that you can go look at or look up and um, see like what unfolds, right? I think what happened in Inglewood is more specific because the Los Angeles Clippers uh, are transforming Inglewood, California, which is a, a very, you know, rich car. It has a lot of rich culture and there's a lot of opportunity there. And even though they're not necessarily a major corporation, they represent a, a major brand with brand names like Kawhi Leonard, Paul, you know, Paul George and all these other NBA players that come from these disadvantaged communities that are trying to also create bridges to give back. And when you typically have a, a, a you know, look at what the NBA did, the NBA did something significant. They put Black Lives Matter on the court during the playoffs. So the whole playoffs and the whole bubble, you've seen that. So now people are going to go back to traveling teams in December this, this month because, you know, the NBA season starts again this month, which is kind of insane. And they're going to have to now drive value to these cities because some of these arenas are going to be empty. Yeah, they're making millions of dollars off of the arenas still because of television. So that's the, that's where the intersection of, of ethics comes in, right? Well, we have to now redirect the value of revenue that's coming to us into these communities because if not, they're going to riot, they're going to protest, they're going to create disruption, right, for our, for our business. We can't have that, so. Great stuff, great stuff. Uh, how can how can like collaboration in urban de urban development be optimized? I I would say the number one way right now is through opportunity zones, because there's a like maybe like what five years left if not, you know time is running out, you know there's a there's a certain time clock on the on the idea of doing the opportunity zones, and there's an opportunity right now for African-American real estate investors to participate in urban development. A uh, reason that that is important is because when we look at like uh, minority wealth, minority wealth is heavily represented by conservative assets such as real estate. So when you look at opportunities in urban America, there's actually opportunities to do sustainable housing right now to increase the opportunity of long-term residents with more sustainable living environments where they don't have you know sheetrock and they have hip concrete or they don't have a uh, full blown, they're not relying on a grid, they're also relying on solar. These things can actually help to increase the collaboration with the, the, the renewable energy sector and also with uh, sustainable building practices. And when you get that investment from minority investors, it actually represents their forward thinking. Right now, the bigger problem is where are the forward thinking investors that typically come in in a time like this, right? I'll give you an example. When uh, things happen in certain areas, like certain suburbs, you don't see the community uh, be destroyed for too long. You know, people bounce back, they rebuild their town, they rebuild a community. Like wildfires is a perfect example of this. Wildfires destroyed Boulder, Colorado, not too long ago. You know, it tore them up. Wildfires is a rising issue because of climate change, right? How are people going to fight against that? Well, they're going to have to build better homes and better housing, better neighborhoods. So when you look at collaboration in urban developments, 
how do you deal with rising sea levels, floods, her, uh, you know, uh, hurricanes? A uh, city like Miami is a perfect example. They got hit by Maria. They got hit by multiple hurricanes. And every time they get hit, they rebuild the city, right? They come together. And because of Latino and Latina investors that are out there, because it's a Latin, it's a Latin epicenter, they invest in that forward thinking, right? Whether it's just, uh, you know, rebuilding the, the current environment or collaborating with urban investors to, in, you know, develop new housing models, such as like container homes, right? Or such as, you know, other, you know, tiny homes, which is another growing trend right now. Why is that important to think about? Because as people collaborate urban developments, the issue of homelessness is going to rise, right? And as property values increase, rents increase, there's going to be a section of people that now you look at the 40 million people that are jobless, facing eviction. At some point, they're going to be evicted. Like, it's, it's coming down the pike. So how do we collaborate to cover the issues that are happening in our community, but at the same time, you know, uh, collaborate in a way that is forward thinking, right? So I think it really starts with minority investment. That means people that have the capital for minority communities to invest in their communities in a forward thinking way and in, to bring change through that, right? Because it's very tangible. Yes, seconding that uh, in terms of community investment, and as I alluded to my um, talk earlier today, that uh, really what could be a big uh, shift, in fact, in um, community development finance would be public banking in cap tandem with uh, CDFIs, uh, it's community development finance institutions, and uh, credit unions, so both the retail level, where if you have city municipally managed uh, public banks, what that could do is that because by nature, because you're much more attuned as a public bank to what the community's requirements are, what their needs are, as opposed to banks that are far more distant, that uh, wouldn't fund you unless you have a uh, formula retail shop, be it McDonald's or Starbucks or Walmart or any of that, or you're doing a single family only ha tract housing district, because otherwise they have no other uh, insight into it, they won't finance you because they'll perceive you too risky. Then if you go down to the uh, municipal level, they have a much finer grain insight to those matters where then they're able to channel uh, credit to where it would actually do the most good. So fundamentally think about it is think of repositioning the financial sector, reposition it. So just like how you many treat say healthcare or power or any of that, reposition it as a, a public utility in that sense. The thing that I would say is you know, is it collaboration that we're aiming for, right? Um, because collaboration to, to, to what end? I wouldn't say that there's been a lack of collaboration per se. Um, there's been, you know, decades back, uh, many instances of joint public-private partnerships. The issue is what have they been serving? What have, there been, what have been their goals? Who has been involved in, in those collaborations? How, how has that collaboration happened? And it's mainly been top down uh, focused. And so I think that, that the key here isn't so much collaboration, but representation, right? And as Joshua alluded to, um, you know, and so it, for me, it, it, in terms of what we're trying to do with State of Place is we believe um, data can actually help um, facilitate a much more bottom-up approach. Um, it's certainly not the only answer. There's a lot of different tools that need to come to the table, but I do believe that it, it acts as a democratizer. Um, if cities are using data, um, data that's both you know, objective and like urban design, like what we collect, but also data from residents themselves um, as part of, especially as part as community-based participatory research frameworks, um, then, then you start to, you know, build trust, gain consensus with the community, have them feel real territorial, like, uh, you know, ownership to, to whatever it is that they're, that they're collaborating on, um, you know, and, and that just makes the whole process that much more streamlined. You know, when I was first talking um, to Paul about this conference, you know, like we, we discussed like what are some of the 
um, friction points in terms of providing better um, housing. And, um, you know, one of them is just how long the process takes from conception to approval to construction to move in, right? Um, and, and oftentimes um, that lack of streamlined sort of process and it goes back down to a, back, a bad way of uh, communication because the decisions were made top down. So then you didn't have trust and then you have all sorts of naysayers and stakeholders that are opposing whatever it is you're doing, even if technically it's the right thing for the community. Um, it doesn't matter. It, 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 you, you, they have, their voices have to be heard and they need to be part of shaping the process. We must cede power to them, not empower them. That's true. And then one of the things that actually we think urban design actually tries to do is bridge the gap between representation and collaboration. Representation means, hey, I trust somebody else to make that decision because I don't trust myself to make that decision. I am not uh, prepared for that kind of decision. But in the world of collaboration, we expect residents to be part of that. And we could do that. We have a lot of gamified tools. We see people waste their lives, 140 million people waste their lives playing Minecraft. What does Minecraft do? It's about urban development. That's all it is. It's unguided urban development with all the tools available. Uh, and so we are in the middle of bridging that gap and maybe turning people from being represented to being collaborators in this thing. And we could create a, a bottom up scenario by allowing them to say, hey, this is what we want. Let's work from this starting point, not that starting point. And I think those kind of things remove those kind of frictions. So I agree with Mar uh, Mariella. Yeah, yeah, we always have been working on the top down approach and we've always kind of figured, hey, somebody else is gonna take care of that. Let's vote who's gonna represent me and they're gonna have our best interests. But we always find ourselves with that resistance no matter where we go, whether it's city council that approves some sort of new building development plan or Amazon trying to enter the area, trying to bring jobs and more development. And they ended up bringing more jobs. They ended up buying all of uh, new, uh, some of New Jersey either way. So. There's no way of, uh, of actually uh, kind of giving uh, that responsibility to somebody else. You know, the, that time, I guess, in terms of just saying, hey, he's going to do the right thing. And then the resistant portion, it's going to have to come to an end because we're now in a standstill, you know, and we see that we have a lot of outdated housing that isn't going to be rebuilt. It's not going anywhere. We're waiting for some fire to happen and so a developer takes over that particular property and that's just the lack of collaboration and that's what we think urban design is really all about bringing people into the equation so they have a real say into what's going on and they can propose real solutions yeah and it's really fundamentally about flipping uh, the script of going back to this, what marielle touched upon the resistance issue it comes from, again, a, a very uh, top-down focused approach in which, and it, that's actually had been the norm since uh, post-World War era in the States, which is build everything to a finished state and then create all these frictions because of the fear that we've built something perfect and everything's just going to decline from there. Whereas the flip side, the alternative would be when you actually trust those at the bottom to do what's right for them in their community. When you do that, then what you enable is it's it's actually somewhat um, much more of a common thread throughout human history. It's actually how humans have built history without cities is you start somewhere, you build something, and then over time as situations change, you're then able to improve and adapt and a lot of dysfunction you're actually seeing right now across um, Anglo-America is really a consequence of this notion of building places to finish state and then having difficulty adapting to change because everything that was put in place was premised on change is going to be negative, places can only decline, we have to keep things from declining versus we're actually starting at a low level and then every step we have the opportunity to build things further up. So it's really a flipping of that uh, paradigm there. And uh, we know today data plays a huge role in society. Uh, I know you touched upon this, Mariella, but how can we tell a story with, this, with data to try and inspire change in cities? Yeah, that's a great question. I you know, touched upon that um, quite a bit in, in my talk um, earlier today, but 
you know, for me, um, my, my sort of career journey has been around quantifying the exponential power of place. Right. And so this goes back to what I was saying before between this kind of inextricable, inextricable tie between land use, housing, and transportation, where, you know, place matters, right? Place matters for um, multiple aspects of, of quality of life, you know, our health, um, because if you can't walk or use um, proper public transport, that has influence on how much physical activity you're doing, how sedentary you are, which then has all sorts of implications from a chronic disease perspective. Um, you, we're talking about also our environmental health, both individually in terms of air quality, but also from a climate change perspective in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, and we're talking about uh, social aspects of, of health, whether it's um, an attachment to your neighborhood, attachment to your community. Um, you know, having these kind of interactions that are uh, that provide the, the, the kind of support and, and social ties needed, um, you know, to to have better, better neighborhoods and better quality of life, um, as, as well as, you know, crime. Um, you know, there, there are aspects that are tied to to the design of places. You know, in, in my conversations with the city of Philadelphia, there's been a lot of talk about the lack of dignity in places. And so if you're growing up in a place that just looks like no one else cares, why should you care? Right. And so that that has a lot to do with with some of the um, incidences of violence um, and crime that the city is trying to to address, you know, and then finally, the there's economic development uh, implications of, of better places, right? It's just, it's just the, the problem with that um, aspect of place value, if you will, is that it isn't uh, equitable, right? It isn't equity distributed. Um, so what, what I've tried to do is literally show through data and research the connections between, you know, the built environment, the fact, you know, and I'm talking about like really micro scale stuff, like you know, whether there's trees and benches and the sidewalks and the quality of the sidewalks, that stuff may not seem like it matters to everything I just listed, but it really does. Um, and so, so I've been trying to craft this narrative around this exponential value of place through, through data, um, not just to say, hey, we should focus and invest in the, in the built environment, but also to kind of address some of the other uh, friction points, if you will, of how, why change isn't happening, right? Well, you know, there are limited budgets, right? We have, there's only so much you can do. Um, and oftentimes, you know, building a tree canopy may be seen as a nice to have, you know, as opposed to fixing the sewer system, for example. But if we can provide data that shows actually fixing the tree canopy has, you know, influence on air quality, which then is going to reduce um, asthma rates, which is going to have in, in, impacts on healthcare costs, right? If you can start to draw those pathways out between the built environment and ultimately multiple aspects of the bottom line, then they start to see like actually the return on investment of these small little investments in place, you know, ha helps us kind of tick the box on so many different things that we're trying to do in terms of facilitating quality of life as, as a city. Yeah. And to expand on that as a uh, practical matter, uh, what is uh, very uh, critical right now is better integration of, because when people say infrastructure, even when they say green infrastructure, it's still a very much around hard physical plant, say parks, transit lines, sewer system, roads, all of that, ports, airports, you name it. But yet things like education, healthcare, cultural facilities, you can call it soft infrastructure, but it's still infrastructure. They're still present for public benefit. And where those two come together most saliently now is uh, one thing I'd like to zero in on since it's a question I've been following for um, decades ever since I started my research career over 15 years ago is about education because it would really, by bringing those together, it's actually how you start merging together two paradigms or two poles that may seemingly be in a conflict. Uh, for example, like we can lay those two premises out is yes, definitely we should ensure, we should guarantee 
that everyone, that all children are guaranteed a high quality education. However, what is not reasonable is expecting every school to be everything to everyone. So in order to bring those together and something that's uh, actually crystallized in my mind just this past summer is this notion of transit oriented schools, as in if you can't access what you need or where your strengths are, if you can't access a neighborhood school, well, if the schools are actually location efficient, very close to uh, rapid transit, then it's very easy to go to uh, any number of schools, say you don't even have to stick in the same school, but any number of schools during the same day or week. And now with blended learning, that becomes an even more viable option. So right there is a potential opportunity to one is not only integrate both the hard and soft sides of infrastructure planning, but also help depolarize some of these decade long arguments on the issues like education, for instance. Mm. And then really quickly, what I want to share uh, that is really fast is uh, right now, there's an estimated 31 billion IoT devices globally. And by 2021, it's supposed to be 55 billion devices. That means that every second, there's 127 new IoT devices being connected to the web. So the internet is becoming somewhat of a public utility. And you look at that. Um, you know, a lot of my work right now is dedicated to advancing smart cities, right? All of my time goes to that, right? And we look at a smart city, you have to look at how now people are being given devices from the employers to manage company or government owned information. And really the point of this is that information is key, right? Information is the most important commodity in the world. And with that being said, we have a lot of unused information with raw data that needs to be aggregated. But unfortunately, there's not enough manpower to ship through all this data. So one of the biggest ways in which we can empower storytellers is to help them understand, you know, pattern recognition is one of the most easiest thing that the brain already does. But in terms of applying it to data in data analytics, we can actually help to increase the appetite for, you know, non-technical decision makers to use pattern recognition to make very articulate thoughts and essentially influence the direction they're going in. And that's very important because if we don't create a unified language to eliminate the jargon from not only industry, but also technical uh, people, then we will not be able to communicate as human beings with each other. And that's one of the most important things in human centered design, right? Is how do you transform cities and communities through uh, natural language, right? Everyday language, right? And when you look at that component, I just mentioned something that's very important, which is digital transformation. Innovation and digital transformation are not the same thing. Innovation is what we've been doing, but now it's time for the transformation. And that's the adoption of tech. That is getting what's already been innovated in the hands of the right people so that they can utilize it. Because right now, innovation is outpacing adoption. We keep building new stuff and new things, but people are still not using them. So for all the stuff I mentioned, the last thing I'll leave you with in this scenario is that for every person that is around, they have about four connected devices on the average. And as the, as, the, as the idea of connected devices from wearables to cell phones and other things grow, it's supposed to be 11 by 2025. That the average person have 11 connected devices from their smart home to their personal wearables and other things like that. Now, if you imagine that only about 50% of the world are, are actually active users on the internet. So if you think about that, we haven't even onboarded the whole world to one of the biggest innovations of our time, the internet, and we are consuming bandwidth already because of IoT. So when you think about the opportunity to empower storytellers with data, it's really gonna come from the you know connectivity of devices because right now we rely on that to collect data, sensitive data from water sensors, all the way down to just employee devices that you are used for inspections and other things that are relevant to uh, city businesses, right? Um, so I just want to share that. Great. We have uh, about six minutes left. Uh, I'd like to welcome any closing remarks uh, targeting maybe the residents or politicians in Bayonne on uh, what they can do to try and foster some some change. 
Well, um, shall I begin here uh, from a broad uh, region level framing? And um, this is something imperative, not just for uh, Bayonne, but for uh, any region across states or anywhere in the world. Just don't think of these issues just in terms of your own municipality. So think of how your municipality, how your municipality is positioned within the much uh, broader region. So for example, if you take uh, Bayonne, for instance, a good uh, case study for lessons learned would be think uh, Tel Aviv, if you take Hudson County, it's actually very comparable in the layout of a human settlement and the job uh, distribution, spatial distribution to a city of uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Israel, slightly higher in population, but otherwise very similar. So, and you could think of even as Tel Aviv, then add another city, make a city of 10 million plus next to it. That's what you get with uh, Hudson County. So one way is figure out so where are you position just instead of trying, and it's a problem, it's less of an issue I find in the tri-state area, honestly, than I find in many other places in the country. But don't think that you are actually competing. Don't think that another municipality, especially in your own region, that their gang is your law story of that. Figure out how, let's say if one area, one part of this region gains, how can you build upon those gains even further and then from investments within your municipality, how would that also benefit others in the municipality surrounding? So that's where I'm trying to get at. That's what we're trying to get at in terms of what genuine representation and collaboration looks like is building each other up in a positive sum game as opposed to treating things around economic development as a zero sum game. So that's something to keep in mind uh, going forward at the uh, broad uh, region level. One thing I want to quickly share in closing is that, uh, and you mentioned that you just did a great job mentioning this, but to be hyper local here, one of the most powerful public assets in Bayonne uh, that is relevant to all of this is the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It's actually a very established partnership that exists and there's a number of people that rely on them making the right decisions, not from only commuters, but public transportation and so on. So when you look at that part of New Jersey, there's a lot of commuters that go from New Jersey to New York to, because they have to work. And now with the opportunities for remote work and everything else, one of the biggest challenges we're gonna have is how do we cater to local needs versus regional needs? And if you look at the stuff that the Port Authority of New Jersey, New York has done, um, without mentioning now, you know, you as from a government perspective can mirror that. And, and, and this is where systems thinking come in. If it worked for transportation, it could work for energy. It could work for, you know, different things. And we're not talking about like necessarily implementation. We're talking about strategy. How do we, you know, collaborate with public sector resources and private sector interests, right? And I think the, the Port Authority has done a great job of, of doing some of that. Not the best job, so no, I don't want to get it wrong, but they've done a good job at least of, of, of mitigating the risk of COVID, for instance, right? By keeping the New Jersey Transit Authority open to go between New York and New Jersey, because they're going to stop that, right? What would happen for people that need to go to New York every day for their jobs? And then they say, you know what, we're not going to support this uh, interstate travel. If you notice, whenever they said, uh, for instance, when Governor Cuomo in New York said, hey, you have to quarantine for 14 days if you come into New York. He excluded New Jersey. That was on purpose because of the interstate travel that exists. So there's a there's a language that exists between uh, regional stakeholders that I think Bayonne could mirror and implement on a super hyper local level to also uh, uplift some of the you know needs they have right now. Uh, that's that's awesome, Joshua. Um, I really I really like that. That systemic approach is super important and also just like inter-regional, you know, and, and that I think, um, you know, marries well into what I would like to offer as, as final points. Um, you know, I've been talking a lot about the systemic issues, the structural issues that we need to address. I think that that in order to foster that kind of change, the approach that we must take has to be, you know, transdisciplinary. Um, and, and this goes back to what I was saying before around, you know, there's all these different aspects of quality of life. Well, all of them are touched upon by different disciplines. So we need to bring 
um, you know, multiple people that have kind of a cross-cutting perspective on how what they do, the policies that they create, the practices that they implement um, have implications across different aspects of, of quality of life. So that transdisciplinary approach is super key. Um, of course, that lends itself to this evidence-based approach, which I've which I've mentioned now several times, um, because you know, in order to really fuel that transdisciplinary understanding, you do need to you know pull evidence, and it's not just like hard data; it's I guess soft data, it's for, you know, from the community itself. Um, and then the last thing I would say, and this is kind of to borrow somewhat of a phrase from um, New Jersey's uh, Senator Cory Booker. Um, this idea, he had this idea of radical love, you know, I, I've kind of um, extended that to think about radical empathy. Um, and so I, I, I do think that all of it, so, so much of what we're just, what we discussed this uh, during this panel goes back to this um, issue of, you know, if we can apply radical empathy and truly understand people's lived experiences and what their viewpoints are, not only can we foster, again, that more bottom-up led approach, which is necessary to foster change, but it actually ends up being super pragmatic because then you understand what people's leverage points are for change and you can start to um, craft a, a, a narrative, you know, including data, but also other, other communication strategies that address those particular leverage points and, and perspectives. All right, thank you all so much for participating in today's panel. Uh, we're gonna be moving on to Joshua's um, speech right now. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. We know everybody's very busy, but here we go. In five minutes, <laughs> in five minutes, not immediately after. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys uh, coming online. You're uh, giving your experience to the residents and our audience. Uh, we hope to uh, we hope to see you on Judgment Day and throughout the uh, feedback sessions for all the designs that will be coming on for the next couple of months. So that will be great stuff. So you guys provide some feedback to our design teams all across the world that are contributing to uh, designs that will improve the quality of life. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys for the audience. Once again, we're, we're broadcasting live across YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and many other social medias that I don't even know the names of. Uh, we are welcoming Joshua Arma, and he'll be speaking more about gentrifying with a purpose. And that's a very beautiful thing, gentrifying with a purpose, because honestly, coming from Queens, I grew up in Jackson Heights, and I have seen that place gentrified to the point where a taco no longer costs a dollar. Uh, and so I am looking forward to hearing about this. Take care. Hello, my name is Joshua Arma, and I am the Chief Data Scientist at Weah State Research Institute. Today, we are going to be talking about gentrification with a purpose. Gentrification has three primary drivers. These three drivers are the following, supply and demand being the first, neighborhood and first time home buyers. To go into this a little bit deeper, supply and demand is one of the most crucial aspects of gentrification because people essentially want to live in amazing locations. And when there's a low supply of real estate available, the demand increases, thus increasing the prices of homes, the prices of rent and everything around the neighborhood. These neighborhoods that are being gentrified are being remodeled and innovated with new technology and also other types of innovation to bring about amenities that are not typically available, such as if you look at Hudson Park in places near the Hudson River, these areas are now being gentrified to attract luxury living tenants and buyers that want to live near the water in New York City or in New Jersey. And last but not least, first time home buyers are one of the biggest indicators of gentrification because first time homeowners are critical for not only increasing the amount of taxpayers in the city or metropolitan area, but also for attracting consistency 
with people that want to live in a certain kind of lifestyle. These three drivers come together to bring about gentrification. When looking at these three drivers, there are three types of properties that typically you'll see in a gentrified area. One is single family homes, and these are homes that are available for purchase in attractive neighborhoods. The second is apartment homes, which are complex style living environments with spacious apartments that have luxury amenities. And lastly, condominiums, which are attractive buildings in an urban environment with walkable attractions. Condensed living has increased tremendously in a lot of areas in the tri-state between New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania are condensed. Condensed living is very unattractive, but people have been able to overcome that by being able to have certain things such as work live play environments, scenic views, community-centric amenities, and high-rise buildings. When you live in a high-rise building, you are essentially renting a space or buying a space that gives you certain features and amenities that you wouldn't get by living in a single family home. Gentrification with a purpose represents a new approach to gentrification that increases home ownership, but also focuses on sustainability. The impact of gentrification at the moment is around 20% of all US neighborhoods have experienced gentrification since the 2000s, and around 36% of condos are in major cities around the country. This shows that condensed living is increasing around urban cities and around 20% of the country all over has, a, has at least been impacted by gentrification. There are five types of sustainable housing approaches that we're gonna talk about. One of them starts with solar. Solar panels on homes increases energy efficiency, which allows people to use solar panels to use for their electricity. This is a very simple way to drive sustainable living and also sustainable housing. The second is zero carbon homes. These are homes that produce zero carbon through the use of energy. They're also very valuable as we are able to use renewable energy and other sources to bring about zero carbon homes. Prefab homes are built off site and transported to the plot ready made. That means basically that these homes are already built and ready to go and they're simply placed on the plot of land that's ready to uh, be uh, constructed with a pre-built home. Prefabricated houses have taken off in the past few years, especially. Earth sheltered homes are actually inside of the earth and they have part of that as an insulation. So they use the earth as insulation and that is one of the biggest benefits of earth sheltered houses. Earth sheltered houses have become a very popular trend in certain suburban communities and neighborhoods that are able to use their landscape and their environment to produce sustainable living environments. And then the last are earth ships. Earth ships are completely made from natural or recycled material and they heat the home naturally. So this is very important because if you live in an area that has all four seasons, such as New Jersey, and you need insulation, you know, the home is giving is getting insulation from the earth versus having to get, do it artificially. And this is a very, very big important point. One of the more popular methods you'll see in urban cities or in me major metropolitan areas is prefabricated homes, zero carbon and solar homes. These are the top three choices that typically happen in the urban environment. So by taking sustainable housing to the next level, the new cycle for sustainable housing is essentially market ready homes that are available for families to move in that are ready for sale. And by doing tax incentives for new and existing residents to live in sustainable housing, we can create opportunities to migrate people away from remodeling their older homes into new sustainable living environments. And by doing so, this allows them to experience an entirely new way of life through sustainability, but also still gentrifying areas with best practices. And this creates a frictionless movement where traditionally sometimes when you move into a, you know, a older home, it may have issues and problems and you might not always be able to know what these problems are. Even if you do know what the problems are, you still have to deal with traditional housing repair, traditional housing improvement. Home improvement has been innovated upon such that now we can actually reduce the friction that comes from home ownership by just offering a frictionless movement process that helps people to enjoy this cycle. 
So in closing, we are really rethinking urban design through sustainability. Sustainability is one of the best ways to look at how we can increase the appetite for gentrification with the purpose because gentrification as it stands today is not necessarily improving the way in which we are building homes. It only is increasing the populations around urban areas. We are now in a need to not only support the communities that are growing faster, but we need to also support the environment in which they live in. And this environment is becoming toxic with carbon. So we need to create more carbon neutral or carbon reduced environments that can essentially produce renewable energy, have you know sustainable living environments, and most importantly, help everyone live in a better, safer humanity. Thank you. All right, excellent talk by Joshua Arma. Good to have uh, quite the insight over there, especially coming from the AI field. Looking forward to uh, working with him long-term. Uh, now we move on to the closing statement. We'll begin that closing statement at 3, a, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time, so 12 minutes. If you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to reach out on any of the social medias. Looking forward to it. All right, then I'll be uh, starting the closing ceremony. Thank you guys all for coming. I really appreciate you guys all coming and really being part of this and trying to help better the world. You know, this has always seemed like a strange concept. A lot of developers looked at this and they, they, they saw it as a threat. They didn't want to be part of this. They knew that uh, if this was successful, this would impact their uh, bottom line, ultimately uh, reduce their profits because then we're giving empowering people um, to shape their cities, which is not something developers would like uh, and cities have always resisted in many ways. So we're really happy that you're part of this project, part of this process and helping really make the world a better place in a way that has never really been tried uh, or has actually been forgotten. Uh, and we could talk about that in the future on closing statement about what does it mean that we have forgotten the way how we shape cities. I wanted to go over and explain to our participants, our participating designers all across the world, uh, um, what it's in, what's in it for them? What, what, what do they get for their effort? So let's turn on to this one slide. Uh, let's uh, consume it for a second, then I'll explain it. Uh, okay, one minute to consume kind of everything real quick. We have a bunch of uh, submission tiers, right? Uh, basically, our, our framework operates in such that we will allow you to submit uh, uh, something as as a uh, as undetailed as a um, as a three D model visualization animation. What that means is that if you're a person playing Minecraft or or any video game that encourages you to build urban development, and if you can actually make a detailed model that inspires people to want to live in something like that, well, yeah, you can use that as a submission. We find that there is a lot of effort in games like uh, Minecraft or, or Fortnite to build things, right? But what if we had a focus on building stuff that really mattered and improving the quality of life? Well, thanks to, uh, thanks to a lot of good technology and a lot of video games, well, there's a lot of gamification of urban development already set. It already exists. 140 million people play Minecraft every year, and it only keeps growing. Not to mention the 50 other games that involve urban development. So we want to make sure that people at a young age have a, a, a purpose in designing, and we give them a platform to actually monetize their design. So the tier one submission is 5% per use. 5% of what? 5% of construction costs. Now, the construction cost is not something that we set ourselves. You as a submitter may have an estimate, but ultimately the real estimate is the construction company. We're going to use your designs and publish the designs and try to sell those designs everywhere in the world. Now construction in Peru, Colombia, or China are going to be different all across the board, right? Uh, and so as a result, we say 5% of use. We can't put a flat fee on it uh, because it's not feasible. So we're giving you a percentage based on construction cost of where it's used, basically final construction cost. 
And uh, because of our system, our online platform, which we'll be uh, presenting at Judgment Day, you'll see that you'll be able to track all the usage, likes, comments, all the stuff, everything you expect to kind of have a platform to kind of inspire creativity. Tier number two. 7% per use. Now we only give 2% more because honestly, uh, those, those designs are gonna change uh, uh, dramatically in certain areas. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that you understand the value you're bringing on by putting the design drawings versus just giving the 3D model. Uh, the 3D model is really what's gonna inspire people. The design drawings that gets us closer to something to approve and gets us something closer to something we can analyze but it's not something that we could sell to consumers. Regular consumers are not gonna be reading design drawings at all. They're not going to understand those things. 3D model visualizations, everybody does, even kids do. Uh, what do the design drawings require? Well, the, des the design drawings require things that regular architects really understand, uh, things that uh, require like, for example, plans, elevations, sections, things that are really instrumental to get the process starting but really never to the point where it actually finishes the process. Tier number three. Uh, tier number three uh, is a submission tier that's construction drawing. That means basically we're almost there uh, to actually getting to the point where we um, uh, can get approval, right? This is the construction drawing. This is everything you need approval. In an ideal world, even no matter what the zoning laws, here's what it is. Uh, here's what uh, was required to actually get that going. Now, obviously, uh, tier three, we don't expect you to be uh, 100%. It's never 100%. There's always some feedback between the government and the actual drawer. So tier number three says, hey, listen, here's here's the 90% the way, you know. Ultimately, that leads us to tier number four submission, 14% per use. And that's a very, very nice tier. But this one requires that where we use it, in this case, we're focused on Bayonne right now, but we plan to use your designs everywhere in the world so that you can make some money. This level of submission requires that the participant be fully licensed wherever we used it, right? So if you say, okay, I'm gonna tier four, when you submit tier four, you're gonna list the places that you're qualified fully to be, uh, to be the person that, uh, that's the, uh, the planner or the architect of record. And what that requires is that, hey, if there's any adjustments that needs to be made for it to be approval, uh, you'll do it, right? Because it's in your interest to get these things to the finish line so that they're, they're there. Now, if you're not taking the tier four, if you only do the tier three, that 4% is used to pay whoever's gonna make those adjustments, right? At that point, really uh, the adjustments should be minor. Uh, so, so it's many people will not get into a tier four for a lot of reasons mainly because uh, sometimes it's just better to just give away your design, not give away, but place your design in a platform where you're really not worried about the adjustments. Uh, you just know that somebody's gonna use them and we're gonna monetize them and we'll take care of the rest of the process. Tier four submissions uh, is very, very rare. You really have to know what you're doing. You really have to be proactive in a way that you've already kind of gone through the whole entire process and understand the risks that are involved there. Um, so that, that's that. There's some guiding principles about what you should be submitting. Obviously, we know that the uh, housing laws are outdated. We know that it's impossible, I repeat, impossible to build affordable housing given the current laws. Okay, this is undisputable. Affordable meaning what can the average person in that area afford? Um, it's gonna, it's impossible. So. We, we, we understand that there's R2 zoning uh, that is definitely a given, but don't limit yourself on that. Limit yourself on these principles, okay? All designs have to be self-sustainable, okay? That means we need power generating components. We need to capture as much energy as you can possibly do. Integrate vegetation. That means internal vertical farming. Okay, that means I should be able to go ahead and grab my cilantro for my guacamole from the first floor or from my kitchen without going to the supermarket. And it should be grown internally. These systems already exist. We have presented these systems to you 
And now it's your turn to make them into design so that they can turn into reality. Water capturing and treatment mechanics, right? Bayonne residents, they're tired of floods in their basements. They're tired of it. They're tired of switch backups. They're tired of waiting for Mayor Jimmy Davis to do his thing. They're tired of the city council to do their thing. They're not doing their thing and they're never gonna do their thing because it takes money. It takes money that you can't control. It takes money that the city doesn't have. And it takes a lot of effort that they, nobody wants to make. So we need to go ahead and start devising plans where uh, uh, the, the water capturing and treatment of, of, of sewage is self-sustained. And I've already shown you just one example of millions that already exist. Scalable. Design should be easily extended to promote people coming together and, and, and combining lot sizes, right? No one in Bayonne is really happy about their house. They say they are, they give the delusion, but parking issues, uh, outdated electrical wiring, I mean, basically none of that really is going to be something somebody you say, I, I'm really proud of my sewage backup. Uh, but in order for us to build taller, we need to combine lots of land. We need neighbors to feel and band together and feel like they're, they're forming a camaraderie of some sort. Your design should be something that people band, feel like they could band together, whether it's adjacent neighbors or neighbors in the backyard, you name it. They should feel like, hey, this design, if me and you, you, you came together, we could do it. And they will. Neighbors love each other. They like their privacy. They like the separation, but they also love each other. Affordable. The average teacher in Bayonne cannot afford to buy a house in Bayonne. Well, they can't. They can afford to buy a house that needs a lot of repair, where they need to place another $50,000 or $60,000 in repair to renovation. But those are not the house that the teachers deserve, that the nurses that work in Bayonne deserve. These are places that need a lot of work. And we need to avoid that. We need to get rid of this mindset that only people of high income should live in quality homes. That shouldn't be it. Not everybody of your children is going to be a professional. Some of them want to be artists. Some of them just want to live a comfortable life. Not everybody is going to have a high skilled job. That doesn't mean that they deserve a lower quality of life. There has to be a baseline quality of life. And so when I talk about affordability, don't just make a house for the middle income. Think about the grocery worker. Think about the school teacher. Think about the nurses. Because what? They're not getting paid what they should. They're undervalued by society and the government in many ways. And it stops with us. Reusable. Your design shouldn't just be Bayonne focused. Sure. Think, take in consideration the lots of land that Bayonne has. But there are many lots of lands here in Peru, here in Colombia, here in Manila, that will use your particular designs in ways you can't imagine. You want to make sure that they these things are versatile. They can adapt everywhere they go. Adaptable. Don't get married to a single piece of material or mechanics. These things evolve, they change. Your design should be adaptable to those things. Social, what we see a lot right now, the lack of social spaces, the lack of community gathering places. We wanna avoid that. We wanna make sure our communities are not only self-sustainable, but social in nature. We wanna encourage people to know each other, to be in each other's lives as much as they want to. Why? Because people that are coming to live in Bayon want to be part of communities. And if they didn't want to be part of communities, they would live somewhere out in the suburbs where they could be alone and at a much more affordable pace and where they didn't have to worry about parking issues. Bayon residents love Bayon because of the people, not all the people, but the people, privacy focused. Once in a blue moon, 
uh, I get some quiet time in Bayonne. But generally speaking, you could hear everything from the from the windows, even when it's shut. We want to avoid that. People will love their privacy. When they close their door, when they shut their windows, they don't need to be heard from the outside. They don't need to, I don't need to hear a bark from the indoor dog. Uh, privacy is a thing that needs to occur when it comes to design. No one should hear anyone once the door is shut. Transit focus, and this is probably the most important part of what we're doing here. As you know, parking is an issue. It's horrible. People break the laws. My neighbors uh, don't have enough parking space for five. He has five cars. He has five cars in a one family home. And this is a regular thing. He has five cars in a one family home. They sit around all day. They don't move for the most part, especially now. And so no one really needs cars. They need transit. They need they need transit systems that work. But let's not wait till Mayor uh, Jimmy Davis comes out with, uh, with a partnership with a transit system. It's not going to happen. Let's not wait for somebody else. No, let's make transit part of the design for this new community. What does that mean? Creating a car sharing program, maybe integrating a monthly bill that includes a ride sharing program. We'll let you decide so that you can convince our residents of what's possible. Now to join the event, to join and finalize your team, you have this form, which we'll post on our website and we'll go ahead and resend it out to you guys via email very soon by the end of tomorrow. And let's actually go to this link. Uh, oh, uh, well, before we go to that link, I wanna give a special shout out. Now you guys have been enjoying this uh, particular a session in English. Uh, thanks to our partnerships across the world, we have been actually translating that uh, this exact thing live stream across many languages, uh, mainly because we have a lot of participants all around the world, a lot of viewers all around the world, a lot of interest to improve the quality of life in a democratic way all across the world. Because the issues that Bayonne residents face flooding, gentrification, fires, outdated housing, and bad government that doesn't react to the policies that require uh, us to move forward are issues that ex people experience all around the world. And everybody must contribute to help solve this issue. So with that, let's go to the actual form. Here's the form, kind of describes a couple of things. The first most important thing is the deadline of the submission. February 20th is the last day you can absolutely submit your design. Now, as I mentioned in the opening statement, the teams are required to showcase their work and progress every two weeks, once every two weeks, no matter what day it is. This form will help us get into a more perfect scenario. We will set this up and we'll uh, share the calendars with everybody that wants them. All tiers are cumulative, meaning that if you want to submit tier number two, you got to submit tier number one. You want to submit tier number three, you got to submit two and one. Tier number one is very special. You can use any software or game to, sub to submit that. If, if it could be displayed in 3D, in VR, or in web, you can submit it that way by sending us a link to that thing so we can have our viewers showcase that and provide you feedback. Tier number one is the most important thing because it touches the person, not the business side. It doesn't touch the government side. It, it convinces a person, hey, this is something I want to live in. The number of max people allowed on your team is 10. We want you to go ahead and spend a couple of days reaching out to your peers that are gamers, that are in tech, that are in business focus, medical and architects to form the correct team for yourself so that you can maximize value and go ahead and have a diverse set of ideas that lead to a more perfect product. Another thing to note, we're really trying to tackle the R2 zoning. Zoning, as you know, has been up, uh, has been a very hot topic lately. 
In Soho, New York, we have upzoned an area, an entire area, uh, for affordable housing. The opinions of the few do not outweigh the needs of humanity. Humans need a home. They cannot afford a home right now. They live like third world countries, actually less. Actually less. People in third world countries are now starting to have a better life than people in Bayonne, New Jersey, and even in New York. And that's a sad thing. As a person who grew up in New York for more than 28 years, uh, it's a very sad thing. Now, when you look at the zoning layout here, uh, you'll see a lot of restrictions. Uh, whoops. There we go. But the restrictions are the height restrictions, uh, the width restrictions, the setbacks. The setbacks, you can't really escape. However, the lot sizes in Bayonne are very similar of size for the most part. I suggest you go ahead and just stick to the lot size. Keep that as the main focal point. As I mentioned, the zoning laws that currently exist, unless you can prove it, and I challenge you to it, and it only helped two, two families, because that's all that's allowed, R2 zoning, uh, will not allow you to create a, a real change in real estate. If you go ahead and follow the R2 zoning laws, all you will do is probably just give a bunch of rich people a brand new house. I'm not interested in helping the rich. I'm not interested in helping the upper middle class. I am not interested in gentrifying an area and displacing our neighbors. I'm interested in creating true change and so should you be. So what I think the most important part here is really just how big these lots are. They're all similar size. And this is what you should focus on as a pivot point for scalability. The next thing, oops, ah, this, this zoom bar is kind of blocking my view here. One second. The next thing is the zoning map. Now, most of the outdated housing that we are trying to solve is located in the green right here. All this green right here, you're gonna find houses of 80, 70, 100 year old. They're all outdated, 70% of them flood and no one's coming to rescue them. You are the Superman to their solution. You guys really are in many ways. So the objective here is to really affect the areas like this. This R2 green zone is the area that is in more, most dire need. This new zone over here, the, the new, new Bayonne uh, is, uh, <laughs> is all right. They got a high luxury apartments that nobody in Bayonne could afford. The new areas that are being developed here, actually they're, they're about to put a nice little uh, studio. Uh, they are also all right. This area is being redeveloped left and right in places uh, for, for people that don't live here in, I guess, prices that people can't afford. But the overall challenge is really convince people, businesses and governments that your designs will improve their quality of life. Because if that is something you can prove, that is something that is actionable, okay? So guys, this concludes the Rethink Bayonne opening. Uh, let me go ahead and turn my camera. This concludes the Rethink Bayonne opening. I really appreciate uh, everybody coming online and uh, being part of this uh, exciting new way of thinking of real estate. It's gonna be a very, very fun ride. Uh, we look forward to all the teams that are gonna be submitting all this stuff. There's a lot of pressures. Uh, it's a lot of pressure. We're doing something that is really revolutionary in many cases. It hasn't been done before. And as a result, we live in the endless cycle of bad housing. But we are Rethink Beyond. And the cycle of bad housing ends with us. And it starts with you joining this event, being part of not just the design process, but also being part of the commentary, being a judge, being a panelist, but more importantly, listening. 
listening to something that you wanted to hear or you didn't want to hear or didn't know and acting accordingly. Getting the community involved in a way that has never been done so that they can shape their city. So the next time when you think about, wait, nobody asked me to build something. No, this was your forum. This was where you could have had your voice heard. And this is the way your voice will be heard. Thank you so much for everybody joining. We are Rethink Urban Design. And together, we will design a better quality of life.